So I'm just a little technologically challenged. Good, there we go. So you got it? I, I, I do a lot on my phone. It's OK. It's legal here to say you have your Bible on your phone. I don't think you're texting while uh, I'm preaching if I see you looking at your phone. So ready? We'll read it out loud, and then we'll pray. It's 1 Samuel 17, 38. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. And then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. So Lord, we're just so grateful for everything you've already said in this service today. When your people are gathered together, your spirit is here with us. Two or more are gathered here in this place in your name. We came because we're expecting to hear from you this morning, and we already have, about how we're fully known and still loved by you, and what a good father you are. You're perfect in all your ways. And even what Cheryl shared about her own testimony of how hard it is sometimes for us to see you as a loving father, for us to see ourselves the way you see us as a loving dad. So remove any confusion about who we are in Christ. And we are new creations in you. We are Mephibosheth, who had been rejected by the world, was but accepted at the king's table. And you have given us a seat at the king's table today. And we're not accepting lies of the enemy, Lord. We are flushing out every lie. We are taking thought every captive today to the obedience of Christ. And we say about ourselves who you say we are, not who the enemy says we are, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we'll get a little lesson on, on David and Saul today. And probably not that hard to realize that David could represent living by the Spirit and Saul could represent living by our flesh. It's not a perfect analogy because David certainly made a lot of mistakes and Saul did some good things in his life. So it's not 100%. And I'll try to tie that in as well. But the thing is that every one of us, no matter where we live in the world, every human being every day is faced with choices. And the Bible is really clear about who do you want to be, David or Saul? There's only one person in the Bible that says he's a man after my own heart, and it wasn't Saul. So I'm trying to give an easy answer here. Who was it? <laughs> yeah. So even though he was flawed, he was a man after God's own heart. And he's in the lineage of Jesus they said in order for the Messiah to be legitimate, he's got to be in the line of Judah, in the line of David. Like, what a thing to say about somebody, right? So we know David was highly esteemed, even though he was highly flawed. So we're not saying that's okay, the sins that he had, but we are saying there's a goal every day when I wake up, I have to decide who am I going to serve. Anybody remember when Bob Dylan got saved? And he wrote that song, You're Going to Have to Serve Somebody? It may be the devil, or it may be the Lord, but you're going to serve somebody. That's what he said, remember? It's such a shame that he got pulled back by the world because he wrote some beautiful Christian songs. And that's, uh, I find, my personal life, the, the way the temptations come in is my flesh is tempting me to take shortcuts. And it looks like such an easy solution. And why bother praying about this? Because God, I already know God's will on this, and it's easy. I don't have to pray. That's a big mistake. And being married to my wife has really, really helped me to, to, to shift and, and to think about what does the Lord say about this? What, uh, what does the word say? Now, that might sound obvious, but when you're good at something, like in the professional world, you think, well, I already got this. I don't have to bother him with that one. Not true, okay? Every, everything matters to him, big and small. He takes them all, any prayer request. So there's this tension of who are we serving? And I want it to be the Spirit. And that's clearly spelled out in Scripture that you have two choices. You can either walk by the Spirit or you can walk by the flesh. You can be David, seeking after God's own heart, or you could be Saul, who you know, unfortunately just kept relying on his own logic and his own good ideas, and he was very impatient in the course of his life. So this says that Saul, even though for 40 days Goliath was coming out and yelling and tempting and harassing Israel's army, David went down there to deliver food for his brothers, and he stepped into this scene. He's like, what's wrong with this picture? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that's challenging the armies of God? And they were all too afraid to go fight Goliath. 
And David said, you know, I'll do it. I'll, I'll do it. And Saul said, okay, so the first thing I'll do is give you my armor. And how many know if you haven't tested armor, it could hurt you more than it could help you, right? So David said, you know what? I'm trying this armor on, Saul, but that's your armor, not mine. I'm an expert on the slingshot. Anybody heard the 10,000 hours expression in the business world? Yeah, there was a book that was written, and it says, in order to be an expert at something, you have to have 10,000 hours of experience. Now, the Holy Spirit can make a big difference on that, because on the day of Pentecost, they were expert speakers of another language. They hadn't even spent one minute learning it. So God could fill in the gaps, but the point is, like, David knew that slingshot so well from all those years on the backside of those mountains. It's a little boring, I think, being a shepherd. So he was probably taking a lot of target practice. And then we know he also killed a lion and a bear, and the slingshot might have had something to do with that too, right? So if you're about to go do something no one else wants to do, you can't take somebody else's armor. you got to walk in who you are. But if he didn't know who he are, <laughs> if he didn't know who he was then he would have thought, well, it's the king's armor, and since I don't think very much of myself, then I might as well take his armor. And we do this all the time, and it's really not a good idea. You have to be comfortable to walk in who God made you to be. You can't be jealous of what other people are doing. You can admire other people. You can aspire to do certain things that they do. It's good to live a disciplined life. You know, there's a guy on the internet now who's getting kind of famous named Jocko Willing. Anybody ever heard of him? He was a Navy SEAL. And he takes a picture of his watch every morning at 4.30, and he posts it on the internet. Because he wants everybody to know he got up again at 4.30, and he's about to go to the gym and work out. And guys all over the world are like, if he can do it, I can do it. So it's inspiring, right? Because he's, his line, which is pretty good, is very biblical, <clears throat> discipline is freedom. That's not what the enemy's telling you. But Navy SEALs, man, they realize in order to stay alive, I've got to stay really disciplined. So discipline about the Lord is also freedom. You wake up in the morning, you start your day in the Word, and you start maybe, you know what, I'll just donate the communion cup, and you could try it. Take this home with you. And tomorrow morning, before you eat breakfast and before you drink your coffee, have communion. Start your day on your knees. First thing, get on your knees and say, I'm giving this day over to you, Lord. The bread, obviously you break it and you say, this is my flesh. It's, you know, it's flawed. The heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Yes, I'm a Christian, but that tempter, the Saul spirit is just always right there. It says in Genesis, crouching at the door, sin is desiring to have me. So if I'm not intentional about making the choice to follow the Lord every day, then I'm lacking discipline. And in those weak areas, he's going to come in. And look, David was a man after God's own heart and the devil still came in through a besetting sin in his life. Clearly, he had a problem with his sexual appetite, and it never got resolved. So we're going to try to talk about some of these things today. But before I do, let's just think about a little history of, of uh, what, we, what we read about. I, I summarized it when I put the post up on the web and said, uh, uh, October 31st, right, you all lived through that Halloween this past week, is a day when people in America put on masks as Christians, and then in quotes, right, Romans 8, 1, there is therefore, no, therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, right? So in, in quotes it says, as Christians in Christ, we can stop hiding. So you don't have to wear a mask. And, you know, Halloween is all about masks and all about hiding. We don't have to hide. But even as Cheryl was saying it, exactly not knowing anything what I was going to share about today, she's like, I had such a hard time believing God loved me. But then there was this balloon over my head, and it was like he popped the balloon, and all of a sudden it came rushing down on me. And I recognized that he really did for who I am, even though uh, she said jacked up. <laughs> Sometimes I could be jacked up and all messed up. And he still loves me anyway. So it's not because we earn it, because we're perfect in our behavior. He doesn't want us to be messing up either. But he's saying, I'm for you. I am for you, not against you. You're my ally. I'm not your adversary waiting to punish you when you make a mistake. But Saul never caught that. I mean, we know David caught it because he wrote Psalm 51, which is a great psalm of repentance after he sinned with Bathsheba. But what about us? If there's still stronghold areas in our lives, it could very readily be that we're not seeing God as a loving father. And, and David 
didn't see God as a loving father in that particular area for reasons we might not have thought about, but we'll talk, talk about today. So anyway, the rest of it says we can stop hiding. David killed Goliath with his sling, but only after he took off Saul's armor. That's my message. Like, look for it in your life. Where am I standing on a counterfeit structure and looking at my identity in the wrong way? I can't see my identity as what I do. It has to be who I am in Christ. What you do is going to change. Hopefully it will change and you'll keep growing, right? And you'll, you'll put yourself out of a job in whatever job you're in because you got a promotion. That's a beautiful thing. God wants to promote us all the time. But if our whole identity is tied up in what I do, then I've got to be like uh, that Bugs Bunny commercial. Remember Donald Duck inside the oyster? It's mine. It's mine. Some people are nodding. So this, I'm really dating myself. But I uh, really like 50 years ago, 60 years ago. I don't know what it was. But like it was one of those cartoons that everybody seems to always remember. But your, your identity is his identity. What he thinks about you is what matters the most. The world will keep trying to put Saul's armor on you to do it their way. And a lot of times it will look appealing and attractive. Because shortcuts tend to look attractive. They're less work. It's not easy for Jocko Willing to get up at 4.30 every morning. But discipline is freedom. See it? Okay. Let's see where I'm going next. Come on. You're going to help me. Did it go? Oh, yeah, good. It's not going in front of me, so I'll just look over there. <laughs> All right, you're going to have to help me from up there because my thing's not cooperating here. So the one right after the girl, it's um, not yesterday's meeting, but uh, where it says, yeah, there you go. So what about the backstory? In All right, we read from chapter 17 when David took uh, off Saul's armor. I'm just going to summarize quickly between 8 and 16. Okay, because it's a long portion of scripture. There's a lot in there that you can, that you can learn from. But what, how do we connect it to our lives? That's, that's the most important thing. We can read scripture as history because it's a true story. But what about how I'm living? And what about the choices I have to face every day? And where is the world trying to put Saul's armor on me? Because I got to reject that thing. So way back in, in chapter 8, the people rebelled and they went to Samuel and said what we want a we want to be just like the other nations that we want a king but who had been their king prior to that the Lord right it was through the prophets so this is a bad sign that their hearts are drifting away from the Lord and then God speaks to Samuel in that chapter it says they haven't rejected you Samuel they've rejected me God speaking to Samuel and then Samuel says, okay, if you want to go down this road, you're going to call out to the Lord, but he's not going to answer you because you're rejecting him as king. So you're going to go under the rule of a man, a flawed man, when you had God as a choice. And that's Saul's spirit. You could do it the world's way because it's convenient and it's easy. This could be on your job especially, right, because probably most of us work in settings where they're not thinking through the lens of the Bible as their worldview, right? I'm just looking around and I know, I know yours isn't. And all of a sudden, now here I am, this Christian in the midst of this worldview, and I just said God's going to help us find favor, but it's not always because we're doing what the rest of the people on our job want us to do. Sometimes we're, we're taking a stand about something that they find very inconvenient. But what does God want us to do? That's what he can bless when we're obedient. So right at the end of Sam, uh, 1 Samuel 8, God says, Heed their voice and make them a king. And then in chapter 9, it says, there was not a more handsome person in Israel than who? Saul. And he was the tallest one, like head and shoulders. How important is that to God, what our outward appearance is? <laughs> not very. How many are happy about that? <laughs> yeah. Because if you didn't win those genetic sweepstakes, right, you still are valuable. Yeah. All of us are valuable in God's eyes, but the world puts that grid on it too. You got to have the perfect figure, the perfect shape, perfect dimensions, whatever. That's a losing strategy. He doesn't value us based on outward appearance. We know that. It's another scripture that we'll get to. But Saul really definitely looked the part. And, and it was really cool. I mean, in, in a way that God did it, he said, tomorrow I'm going to bring the one before you 
that I want to be the king. Because Saul was a man, a man chosen by God, right? He was God's anointed. As hard as that is to believe when you know the story, he messed up really badly. And then Sam was about his business that day. Somebody walks in front of him, and God says, that's the one. How many of you have an inter interactive relationship like that with the Lord every day that you could trust that you hear his voice that clearly? If you're not lifting your hand, say, by faith, I want that. By faith, I want to know your voice so clearly that you could tell me on Thursday, tomorrow I'm going to show you the person I want, and then know that I'm hearing your voice when that person comes before me. That's how he wants us all to live. Interactive, interdependent, prayer at all times. Is this you, Lord, or is this my heart, or is this the devil, or is this my flesh? We want to know his voice. My sheep know my voice. A stranger they will not follow. And then uh, uh, Saul says about himself, you're, you're talking to me? This is the direct quote. My family is the least of all the families in the tribe of Benjamin. So what does he think about himself? Not very highly. And then in chapter 10, Samuel says, you have today to, to Israel, you have rejected your God who himself saved you. You're, I'm going to install this king because you asked for it and God told me who to, who to put in here. But I'm warning you that you've rejected the real God. Your king should be God. Now, what does this mean in the morning when we're praying? It's like you have a choice. You could do it the world's way and you won't die probably, but you also won't grow into who he wants you to be. You won't fulfill that true identity that he wants for you. But I could live by the Spirit. I can walk by the Spirit, which is a little riskier, isn't it? Because the things you know are usually the convenient things, but to have to continually depend on hearing the voice of the Lord takes more work. But once you see the benefits of that, you won't do it any other way because you got too many bumps on your head from all the times you did it your way. And he wants to spare you of that. So then we read in there, it says that, when they saw him, he could not be found, right? So they're looking for Saul at the time of the inauguration, and they can't find him. He's a no-show. When they asked the Lord, where is he? And the Lord replied, he's hiding among the baggage. Anybody ever carry any baggage with you into the kingdom? <laughs> Selah. <laughs> he wants us to get rid of our baggage. Have a, have a garage sale. Sell that old luggage. Sell all that junk in your trunk. We carry a lot of baggage around, don't we? So this is not a great sign for Israel that the person who's going to be nominated to be the king is hiding in the baggage on the inauguration day. He clearly doesn't have a good self-image, right? He's not thinking that he's the right guy for the job. And if any of you played sports and you ever had to go in and substitute for somebody in a different position than yours, you know how hard that is. You could be the best running back on the football team, but if you have to go play defensive back, you never did it before. You're a good football player, but you're playing out of position. And Saul was playing out of position. But it wasn't too late for him. Because God still get, said, this is the one I'm choosing. And, and we find out in Scripture that God says, if you listen to me, you'll prosper. If you don't, you won't. So that's the choice that we all get. Because I was in a Bible study, and somebody that was really new and didn't, hadn't read this story before said, it seems like God is playing him. <laughs> you know what I mean by that? It's like he had no shot. God didn't want them to have a king in the first place, so he just put him in there, and all this bad stuff happened because God was trying to teach them a lesson. Man, that's not good theology. Okay? It's not good theology. Saul could have recognized the anointing on David's life. And he could have said, it's clear that God wants you to be the king. I'll be your secretary of defense. I'll be whoever you want. I'll serve in your cabinet. The anointing's on you, not on me. I was not the right guy for the job. You clearly are. It's hard to do, isn't it? Because now all of a sudden, you know that you're playing out of position, but you want everybody else to think that you're supposed to be there. How much work is that? I didn't go to the Juilliard School of Acting here. If there is one, I don't know. But man, like this is a lot of work to have to act to live up somebody else's expectation of who they think you should be. No, live up to what God says you should be. Throw your slingshot, man. You don't need Saul's armor. You're going to kill the giant with what you know. But so often, we never feel confident in that because we didn't get enough validation around it. Getting there? Okay. Oh, look, it's working. Whew. All right, I want to go back one. 
Okay, good. I'm there. So then we get to ch uh, chapter 12. And it says, Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Oh, that tells us it's a sin not to pray. So Sam is like, look, I know this is not God's original plan, but he's blessing it, and he's telling us who, who your king is going to be. It's going to be Saul. It's not too late. You're not going off the rails, but you better obey what he tells you. So far be it from me, even though I think it's a bad idea that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Wow. <laughs> what does that tell you about our prayer life? That if we're not praying, it's a sin. Mm. It wasn't just Samuel. And then Samuel comes up to Saul in one of the very well-known scenes in the Bible. And it's like, you were supposed to wait for me. I told you not to, to do the offering until I got here. What have you done? And this is 1 Samuel 13. And Saul says, I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. And Samuel says, you've done foolishly. Your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And that was David on the backside of that mountain. God says in 1 Samuel 15, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned his back from following me. And some people read that and say, oh, well, God made a mistake. He didn't make a mistake. It's that Saul had a choice. We all have a choice of whether we want to listen to the Saul spirit in us or whether we want to go the route of David and be the man after God's own heart. This is daily, isn't it? Am I the only one? I get tempted often, often. And it's a constant thing of discipline. I love that expression. Obviously, I've said it enough. Discipline is freedom. Reading the word, staying in the word, watching what I listen to, watching what I go, goes in my eye gate and my ear gate. You could call that legalism. I call it protection, right? I call it keeping my immune system strong and, and my gut biology or whatever that is, you know, and, and nutrition is I want a healthy culture in my body. And if I'm feeding garbage in, guess what comes out? You knew that one already, didn't you? So 1 Samuel 16, this is where it gets a little touchy. Because God says to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing that I have rejected him? There's no slide for this, so don't worry. I didn't put a slide. just wanted to summarize it. How long are you going to mourn, Samuel, for Saul? I've rejected him from reigning over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and go, for I have provided myself a king among Jesse's sons. What a great thing that we know God is in charge. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. He is in charge. He's seated on the throne. Our lives look very chaotic. The political scene looks very chaotic, doesn't it? You try to watch these stories on the news, and it's like, oh, what the heck is going on? I watch one channel, and then I look at the other channel, and it's a totally opposite story. It's like marriage counseling. <laughs> it really is. Because if I talk to the wife by herself, and then I talk to the husband by herself, I'm like, you two people can't be married. That's two totally different stories. Now, and I'm sure that would be true if me and Trish, you know, had that too. I'm not criticizing anybody. It's just so human nature that we see things through a certain lens. And everybody else that doesn't see it that way is wrong, and we're right. And if they could just be more like me, the world would be a better place. No. Right? We all have something we can learn. So Samuel's there, and he sees these sons coming by him, and they're very big and strong. They're soldiers, and oh, Samuel's, that's Samuel. Very, very mature guy, pro prophet, saying, this must be the one, because he looks the part. <laughs> and God says to him, wait a minute, don't look at his appearance or his physical stature. I've refused him. The Lord does not see as a man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the... Not at the resume, not at the bank account, not at all the car that you drive. That isn't it. I look at your heart. So that better be where we start, with the heart. Saul and David is battling over your heart. We think it's our mind, but, but the Bible says guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. This up here, the mind is driven by what's in here of our motives, right? So you change this and this changes. And then that's this is the part that I was saying gets touchy because 
Samuel says to Jesse, wait a minute. I, I saw all these sons come by, and he didn't give me the green light on any of them. Another sign of how well Samuel knew the voice of the Lord. Not to, No, there's got to be another one. And, and, and Jesse's like, oh, yeah, there is one more. Did that ever strike anybody funny? What do you mean there's one more? Like, he asked for all your sons. This one's out tending the sheep? Maybe he's a half-breed. Maybe he's not really considered a full son because he should have been called because he's a son. But if he's a half-son, right, if he's a stepchild, now we don't know this for sure. It's just a little bit of speculation. Not really, but, you know, scholars believe it could be true. And, and here's one of the reasons, right? His, mother na his mother's name is not mentioned in the Bible. Right? So that seems a little odd for such a guy that has so much written about him, so many chapters written about him. We don't know his mother's name. There's tradition, but she's not named. And then he says in, in Psalm 69, 8, I'm a foreigner to my own family, a stranger to my own mother's children. If it's true that he was only a stepchild, what would that have meant potentially in his family relationship with his half-brothers. Yeah, he, he might have been put down. Maybe he had the job of watching the sheep because he was like the Cinderella person, you know, like, you're going to mop the floors. We're all going to the ball. And who does God choose to be the king? The one mopping the floor. The one watching the sheep. Because he had a little harp out there with him, which I would call a guitar, just for modern language. Because God loves guitars. And he was writing these amazing songs to God. And only people that could, only things that could hear him were the sheep. So God looked at his heart like, oh, look at this guy. He loves me. He's singing to me directly because the sheep don't know what he's saying. Ha, huh, that's the guy qualified. Never went to school to be president. But his heart qualified him. What about us? And what dictates the heart, whether we're walking by the spirit or the flesh? Because we keep going off the rails if we're walking by our flesh. So this is an important thing, isn't it? All right, so it wasn't just that. He then says in Psalm 51, 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Right? Now, you don't have to take that as evidence. It's not a trial. But it's possible that David was a stepchild. What would that mean to his identity? He would feel like an orphan to some degree. He would feel like he didn't have the right relationship with his father that the other people had. That's what the word that Cheryl just got this morning. I didn't feel like I had the right relation with my father in heaven. We all could have this issue. David had all these other great things going for him, but he didn't see God through the right lens. It was tainted. So a good prayer request is, Lord, shift my thinking. Shift my heart so that when I think about you, I don't think of you as a punishing earthly father, but I see you as a loving heavenly father. And when you tell me to do the things you tell me to do and what not to do in here, it's for my good because you love me. You're not a joy killer. Not a bunch of rules and restrictions. It's rules for life on how to prosper. Be ready to commit your life in covenant before you have sex with somebody. That's a good one. I'll have to say Selah on that one. <laughs> Romans 8. If you live in accordance with the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. All who are led by the Spirit of God, you see, are... Man, think of all the times you read this in the Bible. We're his children. He's our father. Abba. He's our daddy. And yet, if we're tilted in our lens the way we look at him, Saul can win. Or David, even though David had this relationship, when it came to his relationship with women, he wasn't seeing it through the right lens. He didn't understand that covenant relationship. So it gives credence to that idea that he could have been that stepchild that felt rejected. Because, you know, whatever you judge, you end up becoming. I wish we could change that rule. But what you have to do is repent of judging. Not change the... The rules of engagement were set when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. That's just the way it worked. That brought death in, and part of death is judging. And when you judge somebody, you're bound to become. It's a law of sowing and reaping. You're bound to become that. Now, again, it's just speculating with David whether that was the case. But he clearly had a problem with his sexual appetite. It brought the whole nation down. 
when he sinned with Bathsheba, right? Like that was the beginning of the end of the whole nation. Because when the leader is righteous, the people uh, rejoice. But when there's sin, it ripples down, doesn't it? Kind of a sobering word, isn't it? 14 of Romans 8 says, All who are led by the Spirit of God, you see, are God's children. You didn't receive a spirit of slavery, did you? A little louder, please. No. no. <laughs> to go back again into a state of fear, no. You received the spirit of sonship in whom we call out, Abba, Father. How am I doing on time? I'm going to wrap it up soon. So here's something that hit me while I was studying. It's like we have this choice between our flesh and our spirit. Our spirit is the father of lights. That's what the Bible says right here in James 1.17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the, come on, Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And then this flesh side is the father of lies. And lights and lies sounds pretty close, doesn't it? Especially when Satan comes as light. Ha! So there's clearly a contrast here between light and darkness. And Jesus said, I'm going to take you out of darkness and bring you in into light, the light of the kingdom. So that's what it says in 844 of John, you're children of your father, the devil. And you love to do evil things that he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He's always hated the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, it's consistent with his character, for he's a liar and the father of lies. Why do we ever want to associate with that? Because it's clearly the wrong camp. It's clearly the saw fleshly side and not that spirit side of saying, spirit of truth, Holy Spirit, that's one of his names. Come and fill me. You guys doing all right? No condemnation. It's a choice. And it's the reality check of the rules of engagement that we all have to deal with every day. We don't get to rewrite the rules of engagement. We just get to interact with them in a godly way or in a fleshly way. And I'm going to choose to take Saul's armor off and follow God and not wear some counterfeit identity. I'm going to know what God's identity is for me because that's when I'll kill giants. Not wearing somebody else's armor. There's a bunch of giants that need to die in my life. I don't know about you. So I can't afford to mess around with the little battery-operated toy. I need the bazooka, baby. We're killing giants. Galatians 5, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Sound like a familiar theme? For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. It says in this version. People say, oh, I don't have a problem in that area. You're not the best self-assessment person that there is. And usually when you say, I don't have a problem in that area, you let your guard down and boom, you just open up the door. I think he listens for that one. Oh, good. We have an overconfident person who doesn't realize that they could fall. Mm. Ephesians 4. This is an action word, isn't it? Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life. Who's he talking to? Not unbelievers. He's talking to Christians. So even though you're a Christian, there could still be an old way of life that's still living in you. And that's that flesh side. That's not, hasn't been crucified yet. That's not living by the Spirit. Throw it off. So if he's telling us to do it, it means we can do it. And I would say it means we have to do it. Throw that off and your old former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. And then not just throw off, but what else? You see it up there? So you throw it off and you put it on. You throw it off and you put it on. What are we putting on? Our new nature. Created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. And if you're teachable, man, God loves a teachable spirit, doesn't he? And as long as you're willing to say, huh, maybe this thought goes through. If I throw it off, then what am I going to be? Because the thing I'm throwing off, I really know how to work in that well. It's dysfunctional, but it was working <laughs> in a crazy kind of way. <laughs> You know, the car's still running, even only three cylinders are firing. No, no, junk that thing. God wants to give you a better way. He's got a new nature for you. Created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Remember this one? What do you want? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth, Jack Nicholson said. So this is where, like, the rubber meets the road, because we could say, God, show me where I need to take off Saul's armor. And he's like, okay, be careful what you ask for, because you might get it, because when I show you, you better be ready to handle it. Did it go up there? Yeah. 
That's a heck of a scene, isn't it? God's not saying you can't handle the truth, okay? I'm not making that analogy. I'm just saying when you hear the truth, it's hard to hear sometimes, right? So if, he, if Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, then we have to give him permission. I'm really asking you, show me. Search my heart. Reveal if there's anything in me that needs to be exposed, and I'll do something about it when you show me and not run and hide from it. And then I just got this little grid in my mind, right? There's um, a comparison chart. Which do you prefer at the top? It's a little tiny. You might not see it, but it says flesh versus spirit. Which do you prefer? Stress versus calm. Which do you prefer? Unbelief versus faith. Fear versus peace. Hiding versus transparency. Maybe. Not always so easy. That's the truth part, right? Not everybody's fully transparent. Look, there's sometimes you shouldn't be fully transparent because there's some things some people don't need to know. I'm not talking about over, uh, whatever, revealing things. There's an appropriate thing. But when he's showing you something about him, don't hide from him. That's the first thing they did in the garden when they realized they sinned is they hid. Think of that. The wages of sin is hiding and transparency. But if we serve what it says right here in John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes, how many want him to come? Say yes with confidence because you'll then give me the courage to deal with the truth that you show me about my life because something needs to change. And nobody wants to go to the cross. But he's asking you to take that thing that needs to change, take it to the cross. You know, Paul, when you were talking about that story with your son, it was so powerful. I saw a picture of God coming down with a big eraser and erasing the dividing wall that was between you and your son. You know, like you had to be willing to take a step that was a little scary because you didn't want to be rejected by him. And, and, and God worked it out. God will lubricate these relationships. And sometimes relationships could be one of the toughest areas, right? Because there's so many lines of baggage in there. But no, like God will erase that line. And then you do your part. And when you first reach out, they may have a negative reaction because they haven't heard from you in a while, right? So be, be willing to accept that. That it might not be the best response initially. But the Holy Spirit is the hound of heaven. <laughs> and God will sick the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden they're like, well, they did reach out to me. Maybe I should call them back so I can give them a piece of my mind. And they give you a piece of their mind, and you give them the peace of your mind. P-E-A-C-E. <laughs> when he comes, he's going to guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears from the Father, he will speak, and he'll declare to you the things that are to come. How about this one? Samuel had died, and all Israel lamented for him and buried him in Ramah. And when Saul saw that the army of the Philist saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. Anybody in here ever been afraid? Yes, be honest, because this is the spirit of truth. Well, Christians aren't supposed to be afraid. Well, not if a bear is coming at you in the woods. Right? You're not supposed to live in fear, but if you see a truck coming, don't step off the curb. There's a healthy amount of awareness you should have. So it's not wrong that he was afraid. It's what he did with the fear. He camped out in it, and he took the wrong choice, man. This is not Holy Spirit leading him. His heart was trembling greatly. And, he, and when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him. And Saul said to his servants, find me a woman who's a medium, so that I may go to her and inquire her of her. That means a witch. Find me a witch. I said once before, why would you go to a medium when you can go to the extra large God? You don't need medium. God is supersized. Get rid of the mediums. <laughs> Come on. <Dang. laughs> All right. This must be the one God wants me to look at. Romans 8. Go to Romans 8 up there, okay? It's just being a little sketchy with me here. I'm almost done. It says, the sufferings that we go through in the present time are not worth putting in the scale alongside the glory that's going to be unveiled for us. Whoa. That's really worth meditating on, okay? Because the reason that guy posts his 430 thing every morning is because he knows how hard it is to tame your flesh. And how many voices are in your head saying, don't get up, skip it today. You don't need to work out. You're going to have a heart attack if you go to the gym. <laughs> But you know, your flesh is a really good liar. If you fast, you're going to die. 
No, I think most of us got enough reserve to handle it for a while. Right? I mean, at least a meal won't kill you. <laughs> Another portion of Scripture says these light and momentary afflictions. When you have an eternal perspective, even when you're going through a difficult thing, if you're walking by the Spirit, He helps you see it in the scale of the bigger picture. And we're, we're walking through a difficult time now, but everything we're doing now is counting for eternity. And, and that's not works. That's just the condition of your heart and the condition of your spirit, man. And, you know, when you're in love with somebody, you want to spend time with them. I know we've all heard this, but you should wake up in the morning voracious to get into the Word of God. Wake up a little earlier. Drink a little extra espresso. Make sure you're awake. Don't have your phone out there, you know, ready to check all your Facebook stuff. Start with God. Prioritize God. Give Him the first fruits of your time in your day. I know not everybody's a morning person like me, but I'm just saying there's such a benefit because it sets the compass of your whole day when you do it early. That was just a freebie. But it says that creation waits eagerly for the sons of God to be revealed. Whew. All of creation. Now, if David had put Saul's armor on, do you think he would have killed Goliath? Is that what creation is waiting for, that counterfeit version of David? David had already proven himself to kill with that slingshot. He didn't have to take Saul's armor. So everywhere there's somebody trying to put a counterfeit identity on you, throw that thing off and put on the new nature of God. And you have been very kind to hang in there this long with me. Um, I'm going to end. Let's stand. <laughs> Thank you. You know, the truth um, has two sides to it. It confronts us, and it forces us to, make, to take action. And, you know, if you don't take action, that in itself is a decision, isn't it? Right? We've heard it. You, you're, there's no neutral in the kingdom. You're either moving forward and you're growing, or you're sliding backwards. We don't have a natural maintenance mode as Christians. So maybe you could just lift your hands for a minute and say, Lord, I surrender to your will for my life. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. No other human on the planet is made like me, and no one else will ever be made like me. I am uniquely and fearfully and wonderfully made. And just say that about yourself. We sing that song, I am who you say that I am, and who the sun sets free is free indeed, and you have set me free from that law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. That's what you're walking in, church. That's what you're work walking in. Now, will he give you a new pair of shoes to walk a little better? Absolutely. Absolutely. But are you walking with him? Yes. I hope this didn't come across in a condemning way. Okay? Because that fleshly thing in us will just say, well, I can never change. This is just the way I am. Before you knew the Lord, maybe, you know, because you wouldn't have had the tools to change, but now you have the tools to change. And if he's a loving father, just like you're loving your kids, you want them to flourish. You want them to prosper. God did not want David to take Saul's armor into battle. That wasn't going to get it done. He had to have enough confidence in who he was. And you get that in a loving relationship. If you had a loving father here, man, what a gift that is. It's a big wound in the body of Christ and in the world that a lot of people didn't have that. But now you have the perfect father. So you can have that loving relationship with the perfect father. And I've said it before, but in case you weren't here, there's a great documentary out by a guy about a, a man named Russ Taff, who was a very popular Christian singer back in the 80s and 90s. And um, he you know, grew up in a rough home. The only thing that got him free was receiving the Father's blessing from a man of God. The big issue there was his father's abuse. And now all of a sudden this man of God steps in. And instead of what Russ Taff was used to curses and, and defilement, this man of God prays a Father's blessing over him. No other program worked to get him to stop drinking. <laughs> One prayer by a man who was dead a month later. He had gone to visit this man because he was sick with cancer. And for that purpose, that meeting, everything was worth it. This, whole, this guy's whole life turned around because of a father's blessing. 
Let's, let's just lift our hands and receive that blessing. Lord, we take Saul off the throne of our lives right now, and we install you, Jesus Christ, as the king of our lives. You are the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Help us, Lord, not to just totally change every single thing. We know that doesn't happen immediately, every single thing, but to show us where you want us to go each day and, and not to even have to strive in that process because once we know that you love us, we can kind of sigh and go, oh, you can let the air out. It's no big rush. He loves me. He's not going to abandon me. He's not leaving me because that's not who you are. You said you would never leave us or forsake us. So right now, by faith, we receive that love that you have for us. We receive that Father's blessing that might not have come in the natural because none of our mothers and fathers were perfect, Lord. So you are perfect. We sang it today. You are perfect in all your ways. You are good, good father. You're perfect in all your ways. We receive that love by faith right now. And we claim the fruit, 30, 60, and 100 fold return on that fruit in our lives in Jesus name. Amen. Bless you all. Thank you for your patience. And uh, we are going to have prophetic prayer ministry up here today, and, and uh, that could just be that scent of water that you need.